LM channel. Your spiritual welfare is our concern. Father, we thank you today for your word. Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity that we have been preaching the word. Lord, this legacy you have given us will stand by it. We we'll lay by it. And as one generation dies, another generation takes over. Lord, we pray generation after generation will stand by that legacy in Jesus' name. May none of us be afraid to die. And then if we leave before the others, we we'll pray that this word will continue with those who continue to live in Jesus' name. Give us your word again today. Help us to be wise unto salvation, wise unto the rapture. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can see that. We're coming to you. Psalm 90, verse 12. Psalm 90. I'm reading from verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The psalmist began to pray. He thought about life. Just like you and I ought to think about life. And he thought about life not only in the space of time that we're living now. He thought about life and he knew that life here will one day end. And in life, in the great beyond, will begin. In fact, it tells us in verse 10, the days of a year, so three score and ten, that means sixty and ten, seventy. And if by reason of strength, they be four score years, eighty years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. It tells us then that after we die, we don't just die and stop to live. There is a future. That's why he says, we'll fly away. Because he says, 70 years have gone, 80 years have gone, and then at the end of that, he's telling us there's still life after. That's why he uses the word fly. Then he says in verse 12, so then, teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. It is that kind of wisdom that makes you to look into the future. And to make everything you do contribute to the future and to eternity. In Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 34. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. You're thinking about eternity. You're thinking about the future. You're thinking about what happens after the 70 years have gone and you have gone. After the 80 years, 90 years, 100 years have come and gone, and you are gone. What happens? Mark chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whoever will kind of protect his life, to preserve his life, not take any risks for the Lord, not preach the word, not stand on what the Lord is called him to stand on, because he's afraid and he's fearing that persecution may stop his life, that death may stop his life, because of that he's overprotective of his life. The Lord said, He that is trying to save his life shall lose that life but whosoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake the same shall save it for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and shall lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul that's what the Lord is talking to us about. He says, consider your life. How short it is. How long it is. 
Consider your life, how brief it is. And consider your life, how useful, profitable, productive it can be. And the Lord is telling us to make life count for eternity. That's what I'm talking about this morning, making your life count for eternity. The things you do today, the life you live today, the work you do today, the seed you sow today, make your life count for eternity. As you think about your life, you think about your time. Make your time count for eternity. As you're thinking about your time, you're thinking of the day. Make each day count for eternity. You're thinking about your relationships. You're thinking about your friendships. You're thinking about your marriage. You're thinking about your contacts. You're thinking about your associations. Make your relationships count for eternity. Make your marriage count for eternity. And make your friendships, your associations count for eternity. Think about your service, about your labor, about the things you do. Make your service count for eternity. And make your ministry, what you do in ministry in the church, maintenance of ministry in the church. It's not the totality of what the Lord has given us to do. There's ministry in the church. There's ministry outside the church. Make your ministry within the church count for eternity. And make your ministry outside the church. Your soul winning. Your evangelism. You're touching lives. You're turning lives around. Make everything count for eternity. Your profession. The labor. The things to do from day to day. Your education. Make everything count for eternity. There's a lot to study as you look at the generation which will live. The computer age, the internet age, has increased knowledge in, credit, in, 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 in a very great way. And the Lord is saying that it's not just for education, education, education. You know there are people that just go to school and they never stop studying. They just keep on studying and studying and studying. Make education count for eternity. Make the certificate count for eternity. The labor, the service, your ministry, your profession, make it count for eternity. Your money, the way we spend money, the people that just spend money, they just spend and spend and spend, and they never think, what's the consequence and the result of my spending? Make that spending count for eternity. Your life's activities, your church activity. The things we do in the church, our singing, our orchestration in the choir, our ushering, everything we do in the church, our preaching, our answering questions, our posing questions, everything we do, think about it. How much will this count for eternity? Make your life's activities, your church activities, your family activities, your personal activities, make everything count for eternity. That's what the Lord is talking about today, making your life count for eternity. I'm going to talk on this on three perspectives. Number one, men that count for eternity. You know there are men and women that count for eternity. The things they do in this short space of time. The life they live in a short space of time, the 70 years, the 80 years, 75, 77, or 90, or 100, the life they live, the men that count for eternity. Number two, matters that condemn for eternity. The things that people do, the acts that people act, the actions that people get engaged in that condemn them. For all eternity. Matters that condemn for eternity. Number three, ministries that count for eternity. Ministries that count for eternity. Let's look at number one, men that count for eternity. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith, no. Being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which 
He condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. God told Noah, build an ark for the salvation of your house. Yes, was a preacher of righteousness, but the people will not accept that word of righteousness, of holiness that he preached. But then he, his wife, and his three sons and three, uh, three daughters-in-law, they were saved. And he did something, building an ark. Anybody can build an ark, but the ark he built, that counted for eternity. Look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, he obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. The Lord called him out, and then he went to the place the Lord called him, not even knowing ahead of time where he was going. He did something. He lived a life that counted for eternity. And you know that Lord was a companion. He took Lot along. Lot, his wife, and two daughters. How Lord did not choose things that counted for eternity. How Lord faced directions that did not count for eternity. And the Lord is calling us to wisdom. He says, everything we do here, we need to make sure that everything is counting for eternity. We're, we're talking about Noah, about Abraham. Look at Moses. We're looking at chapter 11 of Hebrews verse 24. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That man could have been a prince in the land, a prime minister in the land. He could have become another Pharaoh because history tells us that Pharaoh did not have any son. And normally in those days when the king died, when Pharaoh died, the son will take over. But Pharaoh did not have another son to take over. And now the daughter of Pharaoh had adopted Moses as her son. And if the Pharaoh there died, as everybody will die one day, then this Moses would have taken over. But Moses said, no, I'm going to make a choice of something that will count for eternity. And now you look at the name of Moses from that time of Exodus when the Lord picked him up. And then when he became the leader over the nation of Israel. And then Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Joshua. Everywhere in the New Testament even you have that name of Moses. Even in Revelation you have the name of Moses. He chose the choice that counted for eternity. And this is what the Lord is telling you and I. That we make a choice today. A kind of choice that will count for eternity. I pray God will give you wisdom. And God will give me wisdom to you, so that we all can choose something that will lead us to life eternal. And the life you live, and the work you do, and the things you say, and the songs you sing, and the ministry you occupy. That ministry, that singing, that life will count for eternity in Jesus' name. In verse 25, it says, choosing rather to suffer affliction. And you know, the ordinary people don't choose suffering voluntarily. We try to avoid pressure, problems, suffering. But a man that evaluates everything that he does in the light of eternity, he makes a choice, even when that choice is going to lead to suffering. Because Moses did that. He said, Yes, I know what I'm doing. I know that this would lead to suffering. But it's a kind of suffering that counts for eternity. And so when you evaluate whether it's pleasure or pain, evaluate everything in the light of eternity. Or it is suffering or satisfaction. Evaluate everything in the light of eternity. Or it's a problem or it's prosperity. Evaluate it in the light of eternity. And this is what Moses did because we're told he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Esteeming the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. You are thinking about the eternal reward. Everything is thought. Everything is said. 
Everything he chose, everything he did, he did that in the light of eternity by faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, but he endured, tell me the rest, as seen him who is invisible. He saw something that others do not see. Choosing something and doing something and going the direction of what actually helps you to have the appropriate reward, recompense in eternity. Numbers chapter 25. Numbers chapter 25. I'm reading here from verse, reading from verse 10. Numbers chapter 25. Looking at it in verse 10. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned my wrath away. Stop there for a moment. Something had happened here. And Phinehas took an action. An action that the ordinary people will not have loved or appreciated. But it was an action that brought eternal reward. I'm going to read the whole thing to you. Let's look at it from verse 1. And Israel bore the shitting. And the people began to commit what? What adultery? What were um, what the daughters of Moab? And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. That's the 